Hello there ladies and gentlemen, TX141 here, also known as Paul, bringing you another Ace in a Day gameplay for the Arcade Mode of War Thunder. In today's instalment, I shall be reviewing the Bayerische Flugzeugwerke 109 Friedrich Wehr, also known in English as the Messerschmitt 109 F4. To provide you with a brief historical overview of the F4, we have to go back to the second half of 1941, with the arrival of the F2 variant of the 109. Powered by a Daimler Benz 601N variant engine, it was soon found that this engine could be replaced with a more powerful 1300 horsepower inline Daimler Benz 601E1 engine. And by the end of 1941, the F airframe had been redesigned in order to accommodate this engine, so that at the start of 1942, this engine was rolled off in the F3 type. The F3 was much like the F2 in terms of armament possessing a pair of 7.92mm MG17 machine guns above the engine and a single 15mm MG151 heavy machine gun firing through the propeller hub. Therefore, the simultaneous development of the F4 at the start of 1942 was indeed an F3 but with a 20mm MG151 cannon mounted through the propeller hub instead of the 15mm. Additionally, the F4 saw the arrival of a little bit more armour layering to the cockpit glass and an additional armour plate mounted behind the pilot for protection, along with improvements to the cell sealing fuel tanks. Therefore the F4 was rolled off the assembly line and into combat service prior to the spring of 1942, and pilots soon realised that the additional weight, by comparison with the F1 and F2, which was a mass of roughly 430 pounds, or 195 kilograms, meant that the plane was more powerful in the level and on the vertical scale yet at the same time lacked the significant manoeuvrability that the earlier F-types had. Additionally, pilots such as Adolf Galland soon found that the armament was not up to scratch, seeing as it was concentrated around a single 20mm, especially with the arrival of the early Focke 490A types. To compensate for this, it was soon found that Rosetzen or field modification kits could be applied to the plane, most notably Rosetzen irons a pair of 20mm MG151 cannon pods mounted in gondola pods under the wings. Although the loss in manoeuvrability thanks to this additional mass meant that the plane was more suited towards attacking bombers when equipped in this fashion rather than dogfighting with enemy fighters. And so really that goes to show how odd the history of the F4 was. Arriving at the start of 1942 to mixed opinions, it was soon to fade away as of the summer of 1942 with the arrival of the G1 and G2 types developed over the course of the spring of 1942. With that being said, how exactly does the F4 go down in War Thunder? Well, as we climb up onto this unsuspecting G2, which has attacked a friendly Yunkers 87D successfully to achieve our second kill, we soon realise that the F4 is good for one thing, and that is energy fighting at an extreme. As we can see on this ground strike gameplay on the map Spain, we are already up at 4,900 metres, pushing towards 5,000 metres, because above 4,000 metres, that is where this plane comes into its element. It will be very rare to see an F4, which is played to its strengths, coming below 3,500 metres unless it is going for a kill and to break back up. Simply because, in an altitude range of 4,000 to up to 8,000 metres, this plane is at its best, with its highest manoeuvrability threshold, highest acceleration and climb rate threshold. Down below 2,500 metres, where a Yakovlev Yak-3 or a Focke-Wulf 190A4 would go to its strengths, the F4 falls apart in terms of performance. With that being said, we're using our higher altitude control position here to chase down an enemy Yakovlev Yak-9K, which is most likely either coming up for us or for the friendly bombers thanks to its 45mm cannon, something which we cannot permit. And as we prepare ourselves to split S onto the Yak-9, we now go over the setup for this gameplay. For the 7.92mm machine guns, we are mounting the Omnipurpose belts, thanks to a good mixture of armour piercing, incendiary and tracer rounds it means that we can get a good effect on target both in terms of seeing where our shots go and potential fires to fuel tanks. Additionally for the 20mm cannons we are using the air target belt. And as we can see here, just a couple of hits from the 20mm air target belt, mostly comprised of high explosive incendiary mining shots rounds, can lead to devastating effects. More so than say the stealth belt or any of the other belts in my opinion. 
We have a 500 meter gun convergence, thanks to the fact the armament is all concentrated in the nose and therefore this is standardised to my playstyle. And finally, the usual 30 minute fuel load to make it to the end of the game, as we split S once again onto the Yak-9K, which is crippled and now waiting to be taken out for our third kill. We can see here in our little shallow dive that we're reaching a speed of 650 kilometers an hour, and already our ailerons and therefore our roll rate is being compromised at roughly 600 kilometers an hour. I've noticed that if you head beyond 600 kilometers an hour, your roll rate stiffens up exceptionally quickly, especially by the time you hit 700 kilometers an hour. And as we go head to head at 630 kilometers an hour with the lag 3A, we quickly dispatch them at long distance by opening fire at a kilometer and providing a little bit of gravitational lead. As a result, the armament is very effective in a head-on at long distance thanks to the overall accuracy you can employ. Yet the lack of spread and burst mass at close range means that head-ons become a little bit less enjoyable, especially if you decide to go head-on with something such as a P-39 Aerocobra, thanks to the mixture of 50 caliber machine guns and that 37mm cannon, which can lead to ample spray by comparison with this plane. We then converge on a Yakovlev Yak-3, trying to take them out or force them down simply because it is the one plane I fear most in the F4. We lose track of them for a small period of time, which costs us dear, as the Yak-3 manages to avoid a good portion of our 20mm rounds and breaks into a split S to break away. We are now down at 2200 meters, an altitude which plays to their strengths, especially to the strengths of their engine, which performs incredibly well down low, and so we level out and break away at 540 km an hour, as we have the speed and the energy conservation to do so. We soon pull the distance and begin to reconsolidate our altitude position. Thus far we have highlighted that this plane is a very good energy fighter therefore. We've shown that its roll rate is decent uh, up to a speed of 600 km an hour, locking up after that. What's more, we've depicted that it accelerates well and, as we're about to see, has a very good climb rate. As we break up onto the back of a B-25 Mitchell at 4000 meters, and, despite both their altitude and really energy advantage, we force that out of their hands in a very short space of time, as we come up underneath them at roughly 1.3 km and get in close, although not too close to avoid the brunt of their gunners. Additionally, once again, we depict the accuracy of the armament thanks to its concentration in the nose, as at long distance we managed to put a good portion of our 20mm rounds and our machine gun rounds onto target for minimal risk. At the same time, always being aware of enemy fighters such as that P-14 in the distance, which can on occasion come into the back of us as we take a long time to take this Mitchell out. At 0.65km and closing very gradually, although trying to keep the distance consistent for now, we're already putting shots in quite nicely taking out the rear gunner, and really just taking our time. We have ample ammunition as well with 1000 machine gun rounds and 150 cannon rounds, which means so long as you're careful with the trigger finger on occasion when attacking enemy fighters, you're always going to have ample ammunition to spare for going for the heavier targets. And this is the one reason I refuse to use the pods myself. I find a single cannon layout is more than enough for me, and what's more, with a little bit of careful accuracy and trigger finger employment, I can pretty much bring any opponent down without the need to employ additional firepower, although we will discuss that at a later date with my review of the F4 Trop. As we break away and that Mitchell heads towards the ground thanks to the fact we've knocked out a good portion of their control surfaces, we're about to get bounced at 9 o'clock high by our Yakovlev Yak-3, and this is where the F4 comes into a nature of its own in terms of its fear factor that it employs. The Yakovlev Yak-3 breaks her head on, and we oblige. At the same time we manage to avoid the brunt of their firepower, taking a very brief succession of 20mm rounds on our tail section, which really spark off. The Act 3 is more manoeuvrable, but also possesses an engine which possesses higher acceleration at these altitudes. And soon the Act 3 overshoots. It's at this point that the Yak 3 decides to split S and should really start to break into a turn fight to avoid us and come back onto the back of us. But just by being behind them as they try to turn fight, and putting ammunition into the back of them, we already forced the Yak 3 to give up and really lose the mindset of being the superior plane. And soon the Yakovlev Yak-3 breaks into a succession of split S's, which thanks to our nose-heavy plane, allows us to come onto the back of them accordingly and force them to continue their pursuit of higher altitude, vertical-style dogfighting, which very soon causes them to bleed all their energy out, something which our engine just pips them to in terms of overall performance. And as they're about to level out, starved of energy, we can line up our final shot and say goodnight achieving our 6th kill for a very tense set of manoeuvres. And so really it's at this point that we have to consider one of the hidden factors and strengths of the F4. 
and that is in terms of its overall impression that it can provide on the enemy team. I find it daunting myself when I'm playing in a Battle 8 in 4.0 game, and I see a Messerschmitt 109F4 just hanging around up at high altitude, because I always have that feeling that it is going to be up there and come down for me at some point. What's more, if I find that an F4, a less manoeuvrable plane than say a Spitfire F Mark 9 or a Kovalev Yak 3 comes onto my tail and is able to stay behind me for a good portion of time, it almost convinces me to give up mentally, and that is what we saw there with the Yakovlev Yak 3. We forced them to essentially become narrow minded, and we forced them into a vertical style of play, which worked to our success. And so that is something you have to consider with the F4. It leaves an everlasting impression on opponents, even when it's actually the less manoeuvrable fighter down low, especially when we had that dogfight at roughly 2000 to 3000 meters altitude. Nonetheless, we carry on here by realising that once again we are already back up to 4,000 metres almost and building our speed. So we are emphasising that whilst we may not possess the best manoeuvrability, we do possess the overall power to rebuild our position a lot faster and over a succession of time by comparison with most of our opponents. There is only one plane which will be able to match you in this regard and that is the LA5FN, which is really your equal if anything, possessing a slightly higher roll rate for less overall rudder responsiveness. This Yak 1B loses their energy at the peak of their climb, which allows us to take them out via a stall. And as we break back up once again with our 7th kill in the bag, we will really now just begin to loiter up at higher altitude. As we are about to see, most of the enemy team has now received the impression that they are not going to be able to touch 4000 meters or higher without myself intercepting them. Which is what we want to do in the F4. We want to clear out a good portion of the higher altitude airspace so that friendly bombers can attack the bases on the level and at the same time not have to think about enemy fighters attacking them. In this position as well we can also assault the enemy bombers where necessary, although sometimes we may have to come up underneath, such as with that B-25 Mitchell. Any other things to note about the F4 therefore? Well, I said that this plane performs very well in a speed range of roughly 400 to 550 km hour, or I've hinted at that already especially seeing as the roll rate begins to lock up at 600 km an hour more, and below 400 km an hour you will find that this plane becomes a little bit lacklustre in its performance. Pardon me. As a result you will always need to have an emphasis on speed in order to obtain your manoeuvrability, because in this speed range the plane can manoeuvre quite well, thanks to the rudder and the decent roll rate. As a result you can change direction quite quickly, although do not expect to win many turn fights at this speed, because you'll either overshoot, unless you're very conservative with your energy and use your combat flaps effectively, or you're able to kill off your speed and force your opponents to actually overshoot you instead. Well, it's very difficult to when you have to rely on energy and speed in order to get the most out of this aircraft. As we can see in the distance, an I-185 trying to climb up, but we've already achieved the effect we want. This I-185 is having to go out roughly 7 to 10 kilometers away from the battlefield to try and build up their altitude and it's already too late with the game being over. So with that being said, let's just take a look at some post-game stats. Upon reflection, we can see that our 7 kills allowed us to earn 18,063 silver lines, along with 1,180 research points with 1,062 of those going towards our work on the Fockel for 90A4. We thereby conclude this review of the Messerschmitt 109F4 by realising that at its battle rate in a 4.0, it is a pure energy fighter made for a high altitude, high speed position at all instances in terms of its playstyle. The combination of a decent roll rate between a speed of 400 to 550 km/h, locking up beyond 600 km/h very quickly, along with a highly powerful rudder and a nose-heavy plane means that you can come around onto your target a lot faster than they may expect, especially via the use of split S's or hammerhead turns. What's more, the nose heavy nature of this plane in a level turn will allow you to cut your turn short, sacrificing some altitude but closing in a lot faster on planes such as the Typhoon Mark 1B, a plane which has a slightly smaller turn circle than yourself but one which can be matched thanks to this technique. To offset this of course you have the wide turn circle and you have a performance which is very reliant on you being able to manage your speed within that threshold which I've already stated. Going at a speed of 700 km an hour for example will lead to your roll rate locking up to an extent whereby you cannot engage a target which is trying to dodge out of the way. 
What's more, the limited spread of your armament thanks to its accurate placement in the nose means that it's going to be very difficult for you to get a hit onto target by relying on close shots. You're going to have to be precise. The durability is nothing to scream about. It is rather average. Although, be careful when attacking enemy bombers without the pods. Simply because at long range, you'll be able to do damage thanks to your accuracy. Yet up close, you may not be able to do the damage quickly enough before your engine takes damage or your pilot gets knocked out. We can see by comparison to the rest of our team that we came second because we employed our aircraft in a manner whereby we controlled the higher altitude position continuously. We allowed friendly bombers such as our friendly Year 2 to go ahead and attack the enemy bases without any interference, and that is where the F4 lies. Whilst it cannot engage most of its contemporaries in terms of battle rating down low, it instead can sit up high and have this massive peer pressure or fear factor event on any plane that tries to come up and confront it, as we saw with that Yakovlev Yak-3. Once we got behind it and kept behind it for a longer period of time than they may have expected, especially seeing as they're the more manoeuvrable opponent, we can intimidate them into making mistakes and playing to our style of play, one that's always in the vertical. As a result, if you're looking for a fighter which is reliant on high speed and an energetic style of play to lead to a complete intimidation of those around you, the Messerschmitt 109 F4 is the fighter for you. And so I've been TX141, and if you enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. Yet until next time, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies.